it's the, the the mind and heart and soul of the photographer which directs the camera no matter what camera it is so there there's a bottom line for you for sure that was joe mcnally i'm aaron from techphotoguy.com and i've had the chance to talk with joe about technology his career creativity and the future of the photography industry let's dive right in Howdy, everyone. I am here today with Joe McNally, whose photographic career has taken him around the world to photograph all varieties of people and situations. Uh, he has a book that was just released in February 2022, The Real Deal, Field Notes from the Life of a Working Photographer. I've had a chance to check it out, read through it, look at all the uh, lovely photos that he included. And today I've got the pleasure of spending some time with Joe to talk about his images, kind of his journey as a photographer, his thoughts on the ever-changing photography world. Um, and so first of all, Joe, um, thanks for spending some time with me today. I, you know you've got a lot going on, um, but I appreciate the opportunity to, to chat with you a bit. No worries. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. And, you know, as I was mentioning to you, as we kind of got ready, you know, over the years, I've obviously seen your work. Um, I've seen you speak a couple of times, um, you know, and one of the things that I've always, you know, respected about, you know, you and many others in the photo industry is that there's a lot of photographers that have been around for a while and most of them are pretty willing to share, you know, their experiences, what they've learned, what they have, uh, you know, <laughs> some of the lessons they've learned along the way for better or for worse. And uh, I appreciate that you've done that. Um, I think photography is important and, you know, the more that we can set current and future photographers up for success, the better. <laughs> so let's start with the book, right? Because that's kind of what, what spurred this conversation. So unlike some of your past books and some of your past work, you know, this isn't really a book about the gear or, you know, a specific photographic technique. You know, this isn't, you know, this isn't the hot shoe diaries, you know, which is what's all about, you know, speed lights and flash and things like that. So you know, there's a lot more to photography than just the gear, um, you know, but that said, I mean, the gear does matter in service of making the photo. And so um, what is your take on, you know, kind of, you know, embracing the latest gear, right? Um, you know, you're a, you're an ambassador for Nikon, um, you know, they have you work with their latest cameras, you know, sometimes pre-release to go test them out, put them through the paces with what they can do. Um, you know, so obviously you have that opportunity where, you know, at this point you are testing kind of the latest and greatest stuff. Um, you know, if you weren't a Nikon ambassador or, you know, maybe earlier in your career, what, you know, what's your take? How important is it to have the latest gear when, you know, how early is too early of an adopter? Good question. Uh, you know, the, it's the, the, the mind and heart and soul of the photographer which directs the camera, no matter what camera it is. So there, there's a bottom line for you, for sure. On the other hand, there is the very practical consideration that when you are out there in a competitive marketplace, you do have to compete. And part of the obligation you have to your clients who are paying you money to go out there and shoot is to render the best possible product to them or the... Mm -hmm the most fully realized version of what you can possibly do in the field. And in the age of digital, you know, that is uh, very directly connected to the kind of gear you're shooting. When I came up photographically, and I've always been a Nikon photographer, but you know, the F series, you know, you go, if you showed up at a football game with an F3 and somebody next to you was shooting an F4, you weren't necessarily at a tremendous disadvantage. You were shooting film, you were generally manually focusing. Uh, you know, the, there were differences in those cameras, but they weren't wildly different. You mm -hmm. know, you could compete still. Right. You know? But if you show up at a football game nowadays and you've got a, a D3200 and someone's next to you shooting a Z9, they are at a distinct advantage in terms of what they can render. So it does come down to an equation of where the photographer has to look at their workflow, look at their mm -hmm. client base and decide what's best. Is it automatic that you have to go for the brand new technology that's just the new kid on the block? Not necessarily, but do you have to remain competitive? Yeah, I think that's part of the, the makeup of being a, pro, a professional photographer. 
Yeah. And I think, I think that's a fair take on it. And, you know, the world of manual when you started it out and now, you know, now we're at a point where, you know, I mean, let's be honest, you know, even on program mode on P, you know, P mode for professional <laughs> in most of the modern cameras, you know, you can get a decent picture in a lot of situations, not all of them, but in a lot of situations or, you know, I mean, look at what you can do with your, your smartphone, your iPhone in your pocket. Right. And so uh, as all of these advancements have happened, you know, in the, in the tech world, um, you know, you know, has your mindset shifted as far as, you know, embracing those advancements, you know, where, you know, where do you draw that line between, you know, let's embrace the newest automatic whatever feature in a piece of, you know, software or in a camera versus when do you stick with the techniques that you know well and love? <laughs> Again, you know, good, good question. I mean, you're, and I'm a bit of a chameleon in the sense that I become what the assignment needs me to become. And I'm an assignment photographer. So sometimes, you know, you, you can simply go out with the, the simplest of kits and render very successfully the job at hand. Other times, you know, the technology that's available to us is a real assist. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, first of all, let me say, I, I have no real nostalgia for the film days. I, I don't sit here and go, oh, you know, Kodachrome. I, I don't miss Kodachrome emotionally maybe, but certainly not physically. Mm -hmm. um, digital is far superior. Speed of delivery is, is uh, you know, a, a very important aspect of what we do. You know, at the Olympics, you know, I shot the, the uh, Tokyo Olympics and the Rio Olympics. And mm -hmm. uh, Rio, I was shooting for Sports Illustrated. And at the bigger venues, I would just jack my D5 into an Ethernet. And my photo editor, editor was seeing the pictures as I shot them. You know, th these are all tremendously advantageous right. technological developments. And again, pending your workflow, um, you know, they need to be embraced, but only as they make the job better. That's the thing. I don't worship at the altar of technology. There are things in the Z9 menu that I'll never access. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those menus are deep and wide and broad, you know, and, and there's going to be stuff in there that I never pay attention to because at the end of the day, it's, you know, your connection with your subject matter and your principal wheels of control remain the same. F-stop, shutter speeds, and the quality of light that you apply, all those things that are time, you know, honored photographic principles. But the, uh, the other accoutrements, if you will, of the digital age, mm -hmm. being able to post quickly and deliver quickly, being able to shape an image, being able to guide um, radio controlled flashes that have automatic exposure capabilities, all these various things. The Z9, for instance, I shot some of the marketing campaign for Nikon. It's the first time in 40 years of shooting, I never lost sight of my subjects because mm -hmm. there's no blackout with the Z9. You don't have that mirror bouncing, mm -hmm. you know, as we, you did back in the days of film and, and DSLRs, right. all of that. Nice, nice. Yeah. And you had a chapter in the book, um, I think it was called Trust the Machine. Um, and, you know, it, a lot of it was talking about, you know, TTL flash, right? Which is, you know, something that you have used over the years, you know, to great success. When, when I saw that chapter title, you know, I talk, chuckled, um, you know, in that I'm often, you know, talking with photographers kind of about, you know, the intersection of photography and technology and new developments and artificial intelligence and all those sort of things. And, um, you know, there's a point where, you know, at some point you kind of have to trust that the computer or the camera is going to hopefully be able to do what it was designed to do. And I think, um, you know, I, I enjoyed that chapter reading through it as you kind of talked about the highs and lows of your, you know, your time with TTL and learning what it did well and learning what it hadn't. And uh, uh, it's just like you just alluded to computers, you know, the, and mm -hmm. programs, you know, there's 1.0, 2.0, et cetera. You have to be patient with the technology sometimes. And you also have to understand it. I, I remember I was shooting a major job for a major health network in the Metro New York area. And they had uh, a couple of staff photographers, nice, you know, nice guys. We got along fine. Mm -hmm. And 
Um, one of them was a fan of my work. We had a great conversation and he wanted to get a picture done and uh, he wanted me to shoot a picture of him. So he gave me his D5 and he said, here, yeah, just shoot this. And, and the D5 was set on, uh, on program mode. And that's a flagship, hugely expensive camera. And right. I remember thinking, you know, um, you know, there are, there's an area of photography, you know, it's an art, but it's supported by the craft. And if you let the technology overwhelm you or you don't understand it, or you just abandon your own kind of controls, the, again, the head and the heart thing that we talked about, and surrender to the technology, which does a good job and probably on program 70, 80% of the time, it'll do okay mm -hmm. for you. But that kind of precludes the photographer's control. You know, um, it's, it's like, you know, I don't know, flying on autopilot all the time. Right. You know? I uh, can't do it. You, you, you want the pilot to take control. Yeah. And I find a lot of times that'll lead to a, you know, a technically correct, but a boring picture because the photographer didn't, you know, they didn't do anything interesting photographically to help make it interesting either from a, from a technical standpoint, you know, whether that be with the light or, you know, their choice of depth of field or, you know, how much blur or not blur they have in the photo, you know, or from a storytelling standpoint of just trying to, what's the message I'm trying to portray here and how do I do that in a, you know, in a 2D image that, you know, is a fraction of a second, um, you know, and I think, you know, and so it's interesting, you know, again, you know, the, having the gear and understanding how to use the gear the right way really is, you know, ultimately it's in service of making that image, right? It's that, you know, what is the, what is the vision that maybe I came out here with today for this assignment or, you know, which may or may not be where you end up because, you know, things change on the fly, but it's, um, you know, it's always interesting to, to look at how that gear plays into that. And so, you know, with the gear, um, you know, the gear can be an interesting story in and of itself sometimes, and, you know, not to take away from the images that it makes, but sometimes kind of to play into the story around those images. So, you know, I think some of your probably most widely known work, um, you know, maybe outside of the, you know, even outside of the photography community are the, uh, the portraits that you did after uh, September 11th with the you know, very large kind of life-size Polaroid camera. Um, you know, fantastic images, obviously strong stories being told by those images of the, you know, first responders and others who were involved with, you know, that, that tragedy. Um, you know, how much do you think the fact that they were shot on this, you know, life-size Polaroid camera that took up, you know, a garage, <laughs> How much do you think that was an impact on, you know, either the resulting images or the process of making those images? You know, how much did the gear matter in that particular piece of work? At um, the gear for that, the giant Polaroid, one of a, a one of a kind camera, right, um, was absolutely integral to the success or the ability of that project to communicate on, on an emotional level. That's where you know, technology and uh, the impact of the photograph kind of lie side by side in partnership because the pol Polaroid is basically grainless and there's a pigment or a tonality to Polaroid that's very distinctive. So when you stand in front of one of those images, which were roughly, you know, the actual image area was 40 by 80, the framing of the each individual brought it to about four feet by nine feet. So when you stand in front of one of those, the impact is very palpable. It's mm -hmm. almost like meeting a person. And I'll also be the first one to, to say that a great deal of the impact of those images were because they were in tandem with the short stories in their own words that the subjects offered up about their involvement in that day, the aftermath, et cetera, their emotional state, what occurred to them as their lives intersected with 9-11. So it was very much mm -hmm. a classic, you know, kind of example of good journalism in lots of ways. 
in that words and pictures married together help tell an effective story. That makes sense. Yeah. And I think, um, yeah, I think that kind of all came together. Well, obviously it, you know, it, it produced great work. Um, and it's, you know, it's interesting to hear kind of how that all, you know, tied in. So, you know, beyond the gear, <laughs> um, you know, we talked a little bit about how, you know, the gear can do the capture, but the photographer has to be the one who, you know, brings their take on things to the, to the process. Um, you know, you talked a little bit about how you don't really have necessarily a lot of nostalgia for kind of the past. Um, you know, and I, I recently had a, a, uh, experience where I, I was talking with a photography group and we were talking specifically about artificial intelligence and photography and AI technologies and cameras and Photoshop and things like that. And we got all done and, uh, older gentleman in the group, you know, asked me a question. He's like, so what, what does all this mean for a, a photography purist like me? And I thought it was an interesting question. Um, and I didn't, I didn't really answer his question. Uh, my answer was, it kind of depends on how you define purist and where you choose to draw that line. I mean, are you a photography purist if you ever use anything other than manual mode? I mean, if you shoot an aperture priority, is that not pure photography? Or if you use autofocus, I mean, is that not pure photography? It, it all seems really subjective. And it seems like, um, you know, I don't know that it's a constructive argument or discussion, really, if the goal is to ultimately make the most impactful pictures. Yeah, I'd be with you on that. You used a very, you know, the operative phrase there, a word is subjective. I mean, um, and, you know, I've been asked over the years, like, do you have personal work? Do you do personal projects and then your professional life? And I, my standard response is there's no boundary between those two. Thankfully, I've done projects throughout my career that I would consider, you know, personal work because I would have done them anyway, but I got paid for them and they were, mm -hmm. they were for publication on some level. And uh, so for me, photography is um, pure, impure. I, I just <laughs> don't have a relationship to those terms. Eddie Adams, who was uh, a, a dear friend, always said that the best photographs are the ones that, you know, reach into your rib cage and rip your heart out, which is a pretty powerful, you know, um, right. statement <laughs> to make. Carl Minans, who was uh, one of my heroes and mentors at life, always said that photography is the greatest force for social change in history. So when you couch it in those terms, um, you know, I think you get down to the central question of what photography means as an important tool for communication, uh, recording history, explaining ourselves to each other wordlessly. All those things, I think, take precedence over any sort of debate that might be able to be mounted about what is pure, what is not. That is an interior question that photographers would have to resolve for themselves, I think. And uh, right. once you're involved in the mix of publications work and you are taking money for your pictures, mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying the idea of purity goes out the window, but you do what you, you do what you have to do. If you need to put up 10 lights, you right. do that. If you shoot available light and that's uh, the the called for approach at that moment, that's what you do. So you become what the assignment dictates you become and you communicate to other people, which is your primary responsibility as best as you can within those you know, disciplines that you bring to bear on the job in the field. Yeah, that all makes sense. You know, and I think that kind of ties right in, you know, you talked about not really having a line between personal work and professional work because you're bringing you to the assignment, whatever that is. You know, you had a chapter in the book where you talked about going to, I believe it was Romania and making a photo with the concept of when the cows come home. <laughs> and, you know, and so you have this, this cow coming into this kitchen, um, you know, but one of the things you, you said in that chapter was you said, I'm really more comfortable dreaming things up than documenting them, which I thought was interesting for somebody who came up, you know, you started out as a, a newspaper photographer, you came up kind of, you know, through the editorial world, um, which, 
you know, is interesting in that, you know, I mean, you get into kind of some of that distinction between editorial versus, you know, photojournalism type work there. But, you know, that dreaming things up, I think, is, um, you know, something that photographers sometimes might overlook is that, you know, I mean, is that how important is kind of your vision and creativity to the success of making an impactful image? Yeah, it's very important. Again, pending the kind of assignment or kind of work that you're involved in. You're right. I did come up as a newspaper wire service photographer, but I realized early on, I was probably never going to be a very good one, you know, because I lived more comfortably in the realm of my imagination rather than the grist of day-to-day news. Mm -hmm. Not that, um, I mean, there's tremendous newspaper photographers out there. I mean, it just wasn't going to be my strong suit. You know, uh, somebody like a Doug Mills, for instance, shooting for the New York Times does a phenomenal job and is very creative within the genre of what he is assigned to do, which is to report the news, Mm -hmm. you know, visually. So um, I found myself in the realm of color and magazines where I had to use my imagination coming up at Life and shooting a lot for Life magazine, you know, we coined a term at life, or there was a term used quite frequently uh, called the one picture photo essay. And that would be the simple fact that you'd have the lead photograph to a story and the elements of the story had to be in that lead photograph because after that spread, that super, you know, great display that you would get for that double page photograph to lead a story, you know, there would be limited space mm-hmm. uh, to for the remainder of your of your efforts. So you really tried hard to bring to the party the the elements of storytelling in one photograph, which required the use of your imagination to a great degree. I also found I applied my imagination when I was shooting uh, for many years for the National Geographic because the kind of stories I would oftentimes get, like human performance or um, you know, uh, globalization of culture. Even even a story uh, I did, my first cover story was the sense of sight. And how do you come up with a lead photograph that speaks to our ability to see? Mm -hmm. That automatically puts you in the realm of imagination, thought process, how do I communicate well? And that's all part, I think, you know, your imagination is part of that, of that, desire to, to impact people with your photographs. What is it that helps you develop or inspire or, you know, how do you breed that creativity? Do you, you know, go off into the woods and spend some time, you know, on your own meditating and listening to a guru? What, you know, what, uh, um, you know, where does Joe McNally get, get his creative vision from? Well, it's an amalgam of things, as we all are. The mosaic of the photographer's life, I refer to that every once in a while. How did you grow up? You know, what were your influences as a kid? Um, my influences, you know, I was an avid comic book reader and the reader of legends and lore and battles and creatures and, uh, you know, adventure things, Jack London, you know, Tales of the North, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I know that spiced or sparked my imagination as a child. I could travel in my head. And that certainly is part of the way I work now, my color palette, the way I I handle a camera, pose people, point of view, that kind of thing. You are, you know, uh, an assemblage of your bits and pieces, to be sure, when you go out there and You know, and I find um, the most valuable time I have during the day, especially as I'm approaching a job, is um, staring out the window, you know? Makes sense. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, just kind of see what comes to you. And, you know, and even the things that we think just come to us at random aren't really at random. I mean, as you alluded to, it's all based on our our experiences that we've had. So, uh, you know, as I read your book and as I've seen you right on social media and your blog posts over the years, you know, it's, it's clear that you're a people person. I think, you know, even if you weren't a photographer, you know, whatever industry you're in, you know, people and relationships would be important to you. And you, you spoke in the book about a lot of those relationships to different people around you, subjects, editors, assistants. Um, 
you know, how important have those relationships been to you as a photographer in your career? And, um, you know, how important do you think they are to photographers in our industry? I am a people person that there are, and there are photographers out there who choose a different path, you know, the uh, landscape, you know, still life, you know, <laughs> those kinds of things are not necessarily people centric endeavors with a camera, but for better or for worse, I've always reacted to people and win, lose, or draw, you know, I'd rather photograph a person than a tree, you know, as lovely as the tree might be. So yes, it's, I think I find my spark there. And, and that is part of finding as a photographer, what moves you, you know, and, and you have to follow that particular channel of energy and, you know, uh, it can come in, you know, many, you know, different ways, shapes, and forms. I, my dad had a book. My dad was in the Navy in World War II, and he had a book called The Pictorial History of World War II. It was an old book, you know, 1960s mm -hmm. layouts and designs, nothing eloquent, but I remember the pictures were astonishing. And as a kid, I would go over that book and over that book. And I found myself responding to with astonishment that there are these photographs uh, that were in that book were so powerful. And I look back on that now. And even at that very young age, I was becoming a photographer and I was finding, you know, what motivated me. That, that's why I always tell young photographers, it's important to read about the history of this industry and to look mm -hmm. at work that's gone before. And that doesn't mean excluding, you know, 500 pixels or, you know, uh, any of the aggregates that are out there, Flickr or whatever, go mm -hmm. ahead. You know, there's some wonderful work being done, but also dive into the classics of what has gone before. And you will find touchstones there that really motivate you, that you respond to and uh, pictures that will take your breath away. And if a picture takes your breath away, then that's a powerful indicator that that's maybe the kind of work you should try to follow or incorporate in your own approach. So, and for me, that's always been people. And I suspect it is for many photographers, human emotion. I, I always feel like human emotion trumps everything in a photograph. And if you look at the history of the Pulitzer prize, for instance, mm -hmm. some of those pictures are out of focus. Some of them are poorly composed. Does that detract from their power? No, because what they're depicting is singular, powerful human interaction and emotion. That makes sense. And as you've photographed so many people over the years, you know, you've been, uh, you know, I suppose fortunate or unfortunate <laughs> as the case may be, depending on the circumstance. But you, you've worked with a lot of people who, you know, are of high stature. They're, you know, celebrities of some form, whether that's in the sports world or the political world or things like that, um, you know when you got to the point where you started getting those assignments, how did you, how did you approach? I mean, I guess, did you approach those any differently than you would any other assignment? And, you know, was there a mental barrier you had to get over of, I'm going to go photograph this famous person and interact with this famous person. And I don't want to just, you know, go be all cra like crazy fanboy, like, <laughs> you know, with them. How, what was that like for you? Well, I think preparation is a part of that. Um, preparation and research really demystifies someone, you know, mm -hmm. also frankly creates an advantage in that you, um, you know, gives you grist for conversation, you know, this and that, you know, uh, one of the higher profile people I photographed in recent memory was Hillary Clinton mm -hmm. and her daughter, Chelsea. And, you know, I did my research. I knew the names of all of Chelsea's kids you know, and your banter at the camera, it puts people at ease. It lets them relax and realize that you've done your homework, you actually are involved. Those kinds of things are very, very strong uh, to bring to bear, you know, when you're, when you're heading out there and perhaps engaging with anyone, you know, there's always information out there about anybody. I don't care if it's the grandmother of the year or, you, right. know, you know, a Hollywood superstar, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, there's information for you to, to grab onto. And, and that is very helpful, uh, breaking the ice, uh, establishing a level playing field. you know, uh, you can't be recessive as a photographer, especially in the face of powerful egos, you have to meet ego with ego. You have to, uh, you know, and sometimes it is, you know, it's a, it's a conflict or it's a, I don't know, game of wits or, 
you know, I don't know exactly how you describe it. Hopefully most of the times the interaction is positive. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's not going to be. Sometimes you have to stand your ground and say, look, I need to do this now. You said yes. So let's partner together right. and do something worthwhile. <laughs> You know, so yeah, it's it's just like relating to anyone you know that you might meet. You know, you you suss them out, and hopefully, uh, it's a uh, the the byproduct that that is a relationship that you build sometimes in very fast fashion is a good photograph. Excellent. Yeah, I think that's that's some good stuff. So, as we wrap up here, just kind of a couple of questions. So, you know, the book, which. I'll, I'll make sure I include a link for folks to, to pick up. I really enjoyed going through it. You know, you mentioned that, you know, you started talking to your publisher um, about, I think it was about five years ago, you said, and then you spent the last couple of years actually writing it to bring it to the, to the point of publication. Um, you know, what was, what was that five-year period? Was that you just, you know, not getting around to the, was it you trying to decide what to say or how to, how to edit it? What, what, uh, what was that process like for you? <laughs> for, for time and brain space, you know, um, my last book, you mentioned Hachu Diaries, I did Sketching Light, all of those mm -hmm. books were whew, 10 years ago, I think, easy, right. you know, uh, writing a book is painful, it's, it's hard, it's hard work, and, and uh, you, uh, you know, you, you need that time to reflect, and if there was a silver lining to an otherwise egregious chapter in our lives called the pandemic. It was that a lot of us, you know, stayed home. <laughs> and I found myself with the time to apply myself to writing this book. And that was where this sprang from. I mean, I have a very, very benevolent and patient publisher in Rocky Nook. And Ted Waite, my editor, is also a very patient guy. And he just said, you know, when you write, that's when you write. And Joyce Carol Oates has said very famously, um, interruption is the enemy of creativity. And I think that's very true when you, um, you know, look at the process of writing. You, you don't write as well if you're exhausted sitting on an airplane as you do at home with your ability to collect your thoughts and in a, a moment of repose. You right. just don't, at least I don't anyway. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Uh did you have any surprises as you wrote the book, as you put the material together, or, you know, put the words into the computer? I mean, any, any shocks, any surprises, you know, good, bad, or otherwise? Yeah, a couple of good ones, you know, it's uh, going through my archive and, you know, finding photographs, you know, that I had not brought to the fore before. Uh, some worthwhile work, you know, as a photographer, you move so fast as a publications photographer, you just accept the fact that the publication might have chosen your best work and that becomes what you show mm -hmm. from that job or whatever. But then when you dive deeper into your archive, you can find other things that uh, still resonate or maybe complete uh, a thought or a sentence or, you know, an experience in your head. Uh, the bad surprises were going back into my archive and finding out just how much shit I shot over the years, how much utter garbage, you know, um, you know, and I think to myself, God, I look at some of that stuff and say, I'm amazed I kept getting assignments because this stuff is awful, you know, and to that end, I mean, again, during the pandemic, I did a, a still not done with it and kind of a major edit of our archive of chromes transparencies and i've mm -hmm. probably thrown out oh, i've probably th and this is not an exaggeration 500 pounds of transparencies over time you know maybe more mm -hmm. you know bag after bag after bag of utter dribble went out the door blessedly <laughs> to its, its final resting place <laughs> yeah it's interesting to look at older work and you know go back and relive some of those memories and you know have the emotional highs or lows as the case may be as you reflect on it so just to kind of wrap up you know you know obviously this book looked back at a you know a long career you're still out there doing things i know as we record this you just got back from the amazon recently um doing a workshop um uh, with uh, Tamara Lackey, I believe, is what I saw there. And, you know, so you're still out there, you're still doing things, but what uh, what's ahead? I mean, is there a point where Joe McNally, you know, retires from photography? Is it is it 
in your blood? Are you going to be, you know, holding a camera at your funeral? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably. Uh, it'll be in, in a box with me, perhaps. Who knows? Um, you don't retire your eyes, you know. I mean, the marketplace will dictate to you eventually that, you know, time to move on. But, you know, I'll, I'll always shoot. You know, I'll always shoot. Thankfully, I'm very grateful. I'm still viable. Uh, we're up for a major ad campaign right now. Um, and I should hear on that within the next week, you know, it'd be a substantial piece of work. So fingers crossed on that. So we're still, um, to a degree in the assigning mix and, you know, we teach, we write blog, Instagram, social media. I have, I have fun with social media. You know, this is a whole mm -hmm. new wrinkle that was never, you know, around obviously when I first picked up a camera. So that's, you know, I'm cautious with it, but it's, it's an interesting way of communicating. So I don't know where the next turn in the road will be, but that's been the case for 40 years. Right. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And I'll, I'll be sure to include links to uh, your website and social media for folks to check that out. If there are folks out there that aren't already following you, you, you definitely should. And, you know, you, you started out as, you know, you started out going to school, uh, to write. And, uh, you know, one of the things I've always appreciated with your work over the years in various forms, um, is that you make impactful photos, but very often you write some interesting words to go with those photos and, you know, to help, you know, tell more story or tell more about your mindset or the situation. So, um, as we wrap up, um, Again, would encourage people to, you know, check out the book, The Real Deal, Field Notes from the Life of a Working Photographer, um, you know, available on Amazon or your local bookseller, all the great places that books are sold. Um, thank you again for spending a few minutes with me today, Joe. I've enjoyed chatting with you. Um, and, uh, you know, as I said, thank you for all that you've, you know, given back to photographers over the years so that others can, uh, can learn from some of your experiences. That's very kind of you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak and sit here and chat with you. It's been fun. And, uh, and yes, to the whole idea of mentoring, I, I was mentored. And I think this has always been a pass it on business and very proud of the photo community that we generally do that. It's a pretty wonderful group of folks. Thank you. All right. Wasn't that great? Be sure to hit the subscribe button down below so that you'll stay in touch with my latest updates. Should have some more information coming back at you again soon. And head over to techphotoguy.com for more resources for modern photographers who want to keep up with our ever digital technology photography mix that we're all dealing with. Take care now.